Hello, friends, on this Memorial Day weekend. Thank you for spending an hour with us. My name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Sousa Mendes Foundation. Today, we have a very unusual program, different from most of the programs we have been providing. Most of our programs have been on stories of rescue and resistance, and that they are to do with the Holocaust. This story is not about those subjects at all, although it is very connected with another subject matter that we do spend a lot of time on, and that is the breaking down of barriers, the building of communities, the acceptance and embracing of the other. We honor a rescuer, Aristides de Souza Mendes, who broke down those barriers with his friendship with an Orthodox rabbi, Rabbi Kruger. And so we love to celebrate that aspect of his action. Today, we have a program on a very um, fascinating aspect of Jewish history from the early 1920s, 1930s, uh, the early 20th century. Uh, and it's about a cantor, an African-American cantor named Thomas LaRue Jones. We have the world's expert on the Black Cantors. He's writing a book on the subject. His name is Henry Sapoznik. You last met him when we had a program about the, the song Hava Nagila. We, there was a film and we had a program all about Hava Nagila. You got to meet Henry Sapoznik there. Now you will see him talking about the book he's writing. And in addition, we are graced with a famous man in our presence, Rabbi Kapers Finney of Bet Shalom B'nai Zaken Ethiopian Hebrew Congregation in Chicago, Illinois. He is the cousin of our former First Lady, Michelle Obama, and he will be speaking first, followed by Henry Sapoznik. So the rabbi will be giving us a historical grounding in the subject of the history of the Black Jewish presence in America. And then Henry will zoom in on the story of the Black Cantors, focusing especially on Thomas LaRue Jones. And uh, we will also get to hear two recordings. We're going to start with one of those recordings right here at the top of the program. This is Thomas LaRue Jones singing in Hebrew. We're going to see now a slide that has um, the the English translation of the words of this uh, cantorial setting of Mizrate Barachamim. So here is Thomas LaRue Jones singing. <laughs> Oh, no. 
great. So I encourage you to start putting your questions into the chat box as our speakers are speaking, and there will be an, an opportunity later for q and I will be moderating it. We do not recognize raised hands, so please put your questions right into that chat box and we will get to as many as possible, I promise. So without further ado, Rabbi Capers Finney, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia, and good evening to everyone. Shalom Aleichem. It is good to be with you this evening from Chicago, Illinois, to share a little bit of the history of the African-American Jewish community in the United States oftentimes referred to as Black Jews or Hebrew Israelites. And so there are a few slides that I want to share with you and a little background about uh, the slides that we will be examining. And I would like to ask the first slide to come, person to bring the first slide up, please. <clears throat> this slide is from Congregation B'nai, Beth B'nai Abraham. The spiritual leader is Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford. He lived from 1877 to 1935. He passed away in Ethiopia. He died in Ethiopia. He had immigrated to Ethiopia in 1930, along with his, he and his wife, and they had two sons born to them in Ethiopia, and they actually turned out to be professors at Howard University here in the United States. Um, and one of the things that Rabbi Ford actually did was ask his wife if she would remain in Ethiopia after his demise. This is a picture from Harlem, 1925. And he started this congregation, I think about two years before this, 19, maybe 23 is when the actual congregation uh, got started. But he was a classic musician. He was a, an excellent musician. He wrote many songs, which I'll talk about in a, another couple of slides. And so I would like to get to the next slide, please. This is the Moorish Science Temple, Rabbi Mordecai Herman, Curia 1925. Uh, Rabbi Herman is an interesting individual. He was, as, he was Moorish, Moorish Zionist. And so he focused in on Zionism but from a Moorish perspective. And so looking at his picture, I was interested to and really fascinated to find out that in Israel, there's a mural on a wall that depicts Rabbi Herman's picture likeness. And it's, it's wonderful. It was done about four or five years ago uh, in Israel. And so he is representative of our community in the state of Israel. And can we have the next slide, please? This is another uh, photo of um, Rabbi Mordecai Herman. You can get a little bit of better picture of his face as he's turned towards the turned towards the street here from the second floor window of their synagogue. I don't know his date of birth, and I've been really anxiously trying to find his date of birth to actually give and acquire more background on uh, Rabbi Mordecai Herman. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? This is our first chief rabbi in the Black Jewish community. His name is Rabbi Wentworth Arthur Matthew. From, he was born in 1892 and he passed away in 1973. He was in fact also from the islands, um, the Caribbean, and he started Commandment Keepers Congregation in 1919. And so our community is over 100 years old. And as we move forward, yes, they were in Harlem, New York, um, and they've always were in Harlem. They remained in Harlem for the entire, his entire existence. As a matter of fact, uh, sadly enough, the synagogue that uh, he first purchased there uh, was recently sold um, and converted into a, a large family living quarter. 
uh, but they were in the building for many, many years. And unfortunately, due to some other circumstances, which oftentimes happen in the Jewish community, um, you know, a spat, two Jews, three opinions. And so based upon that, there was a split and the congregation um, was so his uh, grandson, actually Rabbi yeah. David Dore uh, was his grandson and he is still around uh, in uh, Harlem, New York today. Now, one of the interesting other points that I wanna make about the black Jewish community is when Rabbi Ford immigrated to Ethiopia, he in fact acquired ordination from the Ethiopian Beit Yisrael. And in his acquiring this ordination, he then brought it back to Rabbi Matthew. And so then our ordination, Shmika, is directly descended from the Ethiopian community. And actually in Ethiopia, it's like other places uh, in Europe and other places like that, where the, the church is the official representative of granting authority to other religious institutions. And so we get our authorization in Ethiopia from the Ethiopian Coptic church, which in fact, the, the emperor of Haile Selassie was the head of the Ethiopian Coptic church. So I think we have one or two more slides. I just wanted to share them with you, please. Now, I mentioned Rabbi Ford before, but he was a prolific writer. He wrote um, the Ethiopian National Anthem. He wrote many songs. He was a devout member of the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, headed and founded by Marcus Mosiah Garvey in the 1920s. And so he was very, as a matter of fact, he in fact tried to get uh, Marcus Garvey to in fact um, claim Judaism as one of the religious identifications for African-Americans at the turn of the century. So he was just prolific. He also immigrated to Ethiopia, as I said, and he died there in 1935. But when he went to Ethiopia, he went in anticipation and in the hopes that he would be able to witness and perform for the coordinate, coordin I always say that word wrong, <laughs> coronation of Emperor Haile Selassie. And he did in fact, with his small group of people, have that opportunity to play. And so with that, uh, thank you so very much for listening and for your attention and for taking time out of your busy schedules. And I would now like to turn the floor over to my very compadre, uh, Henry Sputnik, please. Thank you, Rabbi Finney. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, uh, doing this historic work with you. Uh, as the rabbi just eloquently um, uh, laid out, the, the Black Hebrew congregations of this period were vital and uh, were, were dynamic. And so it's not surprising that a functioning uh, synagogue uh, would have the, the professional members of the infrastructure, a Gabai, uh, uh, a, a Balkriya, and a, a Chazan, a cantor. So, uh, so by extension, it is not surprising that these cantors uh, would interact uh, at the margins of the Black Hebrew congregation in tandem with the, with the parallel Jewish congregation. What is really interesting about the story we are now about to, to learn uh, is that the most uh, famous uh, Black cantors, who we we're now going to meet, um, uh, was not a member of a Black Hebrew congregation, uh, nor does it appear, there is no overriding evidence to appear that uh, he was uh, even a Jew, which makes uh, this story uh, so astounding and unique 
uh, in, in, in the history of intercultural dynamics. Um, so without any further ado, let's go to the uh, first slide to introduce um, uh, Thomas LaRue Jones. Uh, born in 1894, the family uh, was uh, born, uh, was living in Nanisman County of uh, Virginia. They came to the um, uh, city of Newark uh, when Thomas LaRue Jones was four years old. Next slide, please. Um, the, uh, as this map shows, uh, Newark was a, a dynamic uh, ethnic enclave. And in fact, at the time that this map was, uh, was uh, drawn in 1911, uh, Newark, with its dynamic African-American and Jewish community, was second only to Harlem for the dynamic cultural universe that the residents uh, created for themselves. Uh, freestanding Yiddish theaters, Yiddish newspapers, jazz clubs, and, and, and so forth. Uh, and so this dynamism of an active uh, Yiddish culture uh, in Newark and an Af African-American culture, really we see in the Jones family uh, this, this uh, dynamic of how uh, these cultures uh, created this family as, uh, as the, the, the productive artists they were. So for example, uh, uh, Thomas LaRue Jones had uh, two brothers. Um, uh, one on the left, Demosthenes Demos Jones, uh, was a noted uh, dancer and singer in uh, the Black Vaudeville circuit, the TOBA circuit, which was uh, the first freestanding uh, circuit for African-American performers uh, uh, to tour the United States. On the other hand, he also had a younger brother, Herbert Socrates Jones, H.S. Jones, who wrote songs for both black and white uh, Tin Pan Alley. So we have in this one family, the microcosm of the dynamic of Newark. On the one hand, uh, uh, popular American dominant uh, culture music and jazz and uh, Yiddish music. Next slide, please. Thomas LaRue Jones uh, really burst upon the scene uh, uh, around 1922 when he uh, was featured in a series of uh, Yiddish musicals uh, put on in the uh, Lenox Theater on, on the corner of Lenox Avenue and 111th Street in the heart of Harlem. And, and the uh, producers of the play uh, reached out to both the Yiddish community and the African American community as a sort of an acknowledgement of the change of the, of the demographic uh, in, 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 in Harlem. And, uh, and here, uh, the, this play, the schuppe clay, the wedding dress, an entire scene as we, uh, is built around Thomas LaRue Jones here posing with a, uh, a Newark boys choir, one of the many Orthodox synagogues in Newark that provided a boys choir. The, the, the program, the Chupaclade, uh, had as its dramatic denouement a uh, staged wedding in which Thomas LaRue Jones is the Meseder Kedushin. He is, he is actually conducting uh, the, the wedding ceremony. And this was sensational. The audience really, really loved this. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, th this, this play was so successful that the producers of the previous play turned around and staged another uh, play uh, at the uh, Lenox Theater, this one the following year. And this one based on an incredibly popular Yiddish newspaper character, the give as good as she got, Haradin, a uh, tough love uh, a woman character, Yenta Telebenda. Uh, and uh, this play also super, super popular. In fact, it was so popular that there were three versions of the play running simultaneously. And with Thomas LaRue uh, running the circuit of appearing in each one of the productions that they staged around the city. Uh, very, very popular. Next slide. The, the Yiddish uh, community was absolutely head over heels. It was a sensation. Thomas LaRue Jones uh, re really uh, reached out uh, and, and in both good ways and in puzzling ways because the, the social, economic, and cultural dynamic between Jews and African-Americans was emerging. And so on certain levels, 
there was a sense of pride that here is this African American who has taken on to to learn a very specific kind of uh, Eastern European cantillation. Uh, but the the audiences all over, both in the Yiddish world and in the mainstream world, uh, and in the African American world, a number of African American newspapers wrote uh, profiles about Thomas LaRue Jones. So he, he crossed over into a wide diversity of representative uh, performances based on his really uh, internalization of, of, of this music. Next slide, please. Let's get to the heart of, of uh, the, the, the discovery uh, for myself, uh, a, a search that lasted 40 years to discover this recording of Thomas LaRue Jones. Uh, as, as, as we heard at the beginning, and we will now hear, this was the single uh, record that Thomas LaRue Jones made in uh, 1923. Fans of early black jazz and blues uh, might be familiar with the OK label. This was an incredibly important label to release what was then called race music music by and for the African-American community. In addition to people like Duke Ellington, Fats Waller, Bessie Smith, uh, uh, Lucille Hegeman, all of the founding members of the black uh, blues uh, jazz world were on this label. OK also had a small Jewish catalog on which uh, mostly Yiddish theater, a couple of klezmer records, but the only cantorial record uh, was the uh, record that he made that we heard now. Now, something to keep in mind before we listen uh, to, to the record, that Thomas LaRue Jones uh, had to learn four languages. That is, he, in order to be the, the performer that he was, he learned four languages, one which is the vernacular uh, Yiddish, street Yiddish, uh, literary, popular culture Yiddish. The other was Ashkenazic prayer Hebrew, the davening prayer Hebrew of the Eastern European synagogue. And the other two languages were the musical settings in, in which those languages were most comfortable. So Thomas LaRue Jones became internalized these languages, the musical language, the literary language, in order to create these, um, these really powerful recordings. So let's, um, just to, to, for a context, Thomas LaRue Jones uh, could have, um, uh, for his, his one, sadly, his one recording, uh, he could have chosen uh, a pop tune from the then emerging Yiddish theater, or he could have uh, picked something from uh, Yiddish vaudeville to show off his, his really, really de fully developed uh, Yiddish, but he did not. The song that he performs here, Yiddle Falil Nit Dein Hoffnung, My Fellow Jews Don't Give Up Hope, uh, is an incredibly important song because what it does is it, it reinforces the historic bond between God and the Jews. And as we will see from the lyrics, this most unapologetic listing of historic tormentors of the Jews and the blunt invocation of Jewish blood bought cheap is simultaneously a throwback to the earliest seedling days of the Yiddish theater in Eastern Europe, the Brodersinger, the kind of the Stettel Grio, who would sing songs ripped from the daily headlines to their, to their fellow Jews. So it's a throwback to the founding of the Yiddish theater, but it's also a, a search ahead for another, it's a leap ahead for a Yiddish corollary to another Jewish composition against racist violence with a powerful African-American association. And that is Abel Mirapol's 1937 Strange Fruit and its unforgettable uh, performance by uh, Billy Holiday. The, the, the analogy to Strange Fruit is, is perhaps not even uh, uh, by, by coincidence. 1920, when the song was first published, saw a peak of violence against both African Americans with lynchings in the South and also pogroms against Jews in post-World War I Poland. Uh, so here, 
is Thomas LaRue Jones as an African-American talking about violence against a minority that he is, because of the limited platform that African-Americans were given in popular recordings of the time, Thomas LaRue Jones was able to say on this record as a black man something in Yiddish that he could not, as a black man, say in English. Let's take a listen to Falirnit and Hoffnung Rebid. Like the um, first side that we listened to, um, the uh, cantorial piece, he did not choose a barn burning cantorial composition like Kol Nidre or, or Eli Eli, for which he was very famous, his interpretation. Instead, he chose Mizratze Berachmim, something that is a quotidian prayer in morning prayer services. And again, both sides dovetail into each other by being a reminder to the Jews about the sacred and long-held uh, con connection between uh, God and the Jews. And what makes this both a good recording and a great recording is that it, it, it shows uh, LaRue's powerful ownership of the tonalities of Eastern European Jewish song and prayer but it's a great recording but it because it also stands in for those black cantors who did not have the chance to stand before a microphone and who we now can see this was a deeply textured and fully formed uh, tradition in the African American community. Next slide, please. In, in 1930, Thomas LaRue's manager, Edwin Relkin, uh, booked the first of five uh, incredibly uh, provocative and popular tours of Thomas LaRue Jones 
uh, going back to the ancestral Jewish homelands between Palestine, uh, Western Europe, and Eastern Europe. This first tour, we see the map here, took him all the way from the West in Leipzig and Berlin, all the way through Poland, uh, through Warsaw, this the world center of, of great uh, cantorial singing. If the American population was astounded uh, by uh, Thomas LaRue Jones's ascension. At least the American Jews had some experience with African Americans as neighbors, as customers, as friends. Uh, in the Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, it was a sensation within a sensation. Next slide, please. Uh, Relkin uh, booked him with the provocative name Tevye uh, Hakoyen, uh, a, a, a nickname of Toive, but also the provocative Hakoyen, making an assumption that Thomas LaRue Jones was a of priestly birth, uh, and uh, his uh, biography that he shared in the Yiddish press talked about a kind of a mythical, a, a, uh, a creation myth of his family, direct uh, con connectivity to Ethiopia, uh, to uh, the to princely uh, backgrounds. And, and this uh, created both uh, sensation and uh, disbelief. So for example, uh, the uh, headline at the, uh, at the top in uh, the Bialystoker Zeitung uh, said, Schwarze Chasen von Amerika macht nun ein Tummel zwischen polnische Jeden. And it says the black cantor from America astounds the Polish Jewry. Um, the audience in Warsaw at the bottom, a tough crowd on a good day, uh, were not impressed. Uh, it says, der Schwarze Chasen, with quotation marks around Schwarze Chasen. Uh, the Schwarze Chasen hat Nächten gehabt in Warsaw, a Schwarze Sof. It means the Black Cantor in Warsaw had a dark finish. The concert was a, a travesty. Uh, and in fact, the, um, the, uh, the next day, this uh, cartoon that appeared in the Warsaw paper uh, of Thomas LaRue Jones with a machzer or a sitter in front of him that is upside down. It is a, it's sort of to intimate that he really wasn't a cantor. He couldn't even properly read uh, out of uh, Machser. Uh, so the, the reaction was always visceral. It was always uh, uh, dynamic. Um, but the, 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 the punchline is that this was only the first. He came back to Europe time and again until just the, the, the year or two before the outbreak of, of, of World War II. Next slide, please. The, the um, uh, post-World War uh, II uh, spelled the end of many of the uh, social dynamics, uh, which uh, really gave Thomas LaRue Jones the platform to emerge as the great artist he was. So on the left is uh, a clipping of his final concert in Warsaw at the Orthodox Congregation of Con uh, Congregation Ahavat Zion. Um, my discovery of a uh, of of the obituary of Thomas LaRue Jones not in the Newark Jewish papers, but this was a a, a an announcement in the Newark uh, the Standard Newark uh, Newark Evening News, and uh, it was because in this uh, in this obituary it mentioned where he was buried and the funeral home. When I contacted the funeral home. They, uh, they mentioned that they had no facility for a Hevra Kedisha, for the, for the ritual cleansing of a Jewish body uh, prior to uh, burial. But the most uh, disturbing uh, revelation was uh, to find that Thomas Lurie Jones was in an unmarked grave. Uh, and uh, so um, a, um, a, I launched a small um, a GoFundMe campaign and the picture at the bottom uh, is the completion of the headstone uh, with uh, some of the uh, longtime uh, compatriots who, who took up the challenge to honor this, this, this man in death in a way that he was uh, not honored uh, on another level. Uh, now, as, as, as difficult um, as, as you might imagine, and quite rightly imagine, how the, 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 the steep incline that an African-American man would have uh, to become a crossover uh, into the Ashkenazic Jewish community singing Yiddish and Hebrew. Uh, the, there was only one thing that would have made his struggle 
any more difficult, and that would have been had he been a woman. Here, Gladys May Sellers billed as Goldie de Schwarze Chazente. Next slide. We, we, um, we, we meet her first in 1924, uh, where she is touring the uh, Jewish, um, the, the uh, provincial Jewish uh, circuit in the upper Midwest and in up, uh, upstate New York and Canada uh, to uh, Jewish uh, emigre communities that wanted their connection uh, to the uh, Yiddish culture of New York. And as the article on the left uh, shows it gives her biography uh, that she was born in Ethiopia, that she is from royal birth, that she uh, was a poet, uh, and that she was uh, a, a, a member of a royal uh, Ethiopian family. And on the left uh, is an advertisement uh, for her, a play about her life, the daughter of a lost tribe. And, and uh, the, these announcements, these are all communities of people for whom uh, this culture was first and foremost. So, so clearly, uh, she was bringing to these performances a depth of understanding that would attract these uh, emigre Yiddish-speaking Jews in these, um, in these communities. And, and an amazing story. But as uh, we find out, the a more amazing story is the truth. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, Gladys May Sellers was born in Milwaukee to a middle-class African-American family deeply involved in the Baptist church. And as we see from the articles on the left, she is already in her teens uh, billing herself as Wisconsin's only dramatic soprano. And in another place, she is, she's billing herself as the Bronze Melba, uh, dedicated to Nellie Melba, who was one of the, the great operatic singers. And But most importantly, we see in this 1916 advertisement that she was a student of Madame Azalea Hackley. And Madame Azalea Hackley was a, an important figure in, 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 in African-American cultural uplift by using Western art music for the uplift of young African-American women so that they would be prepared uh, to uh, compete in, in a culturally literate world. So she was a member of this, this, this uh, the church community. She's a member of the uh, emerging Black a Western art community performing on radio. Um, again, a major change the following year. Next slide, please. Um, uh, she moves to Chicago to join uh, John Ace Wilcliffe's famous ginger band. These, this was one of the first native Chicago jazz bands to form in the outwash of the arrival of King Oliver and Louis Armstrong when they came to New Orleans, from New Orleans to Chicago. So from 1919 to 1922, she left behind the classical music, the religious church music, and was singing uh, in a jazz band on radio and in performances. So what is so amazing that by 1924, next slide please, she is fully emerged as Goldie de Schwarze Hasende. Something happened in two years that she was able to completely internalize uh, the cantorial repertoire, a uh, Yiddish repertoire. The reviews are universal. How audiences were slack jawed at her incredible ownership of this music. Next slide. We next hear of her in 1926 when she moves to New York and is a member of a Broadway company uh, doing at the Belasco Theater, uh, Lulu Bell, a salacious confrontational mixed race play with white actors in blackface and African American actors, uh, kind of a Carmen in Harlem. And this was so salacious, it was so controversial, the play ran for 18 months. And it was with, uh, once the play uh, closed, uh, uh, Goldie, uh, here she's uh, uh, taken on her stage name, Goldie M. Steiner. Uh, she then goes back uh, to, um, to the Yiddish um, uh, theatrical circuit as Goldie de Schwarze Chazende. Next slide, please. She comes back to New York in 1928 
uh, now back on Broadway in a play by the poet E. E. Cummings uh, called Him. Uh, unlike uh, unlike uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 Lulu Bell, uh, this play uh, was was got universally bad reviews and only ran for twenty seven performances. But Goldie Mae Steiner uh, got a great press, and in uh, this illustration on the right uh, is from uh, the the play where Goldie Mae Steiner in the center is seen here performing one of the cornerstone African-American murder ballads, uh, Frankie and Johnny, the first time it had been done on a mainstream American stage. And uh, this uh, illustration by John Sloan, who had, was one of the founders of the Ashcan School, uh, demonstrates her ability to transition from inside the African-American community into the Jewish community and, and, and back again. Next slide, please. In 1933, uh, Goldie Mae Steiner uh, it becomes a member of the performing company of uh, evangelist Tom Noonan, who uh, ran a, what was called his, his uh, Cathedral of the Underworld, uh, as pictured here, the Rescue Society of Doyer Street in a former China, Chinatown uh, opium den. And what was so amazing is that for this radio show, which was basically an evangelical show, uh, she was performing as Goldie de Schwarze Chazenta. And so bringing uh, a depth of, of Jewish content to this otherwise a Christian show. This show stayed on the air uh, for six years, going off the air in 1938, sadly replaced uh, by the show uh, by uh, Father uh, Coughlin, at, uh, the uh, the uh, the racist anti-Semite, uh, but the the fact that uh, this had reached uh, so uh, so many people. Um, uh, next slide, please. We really now uh, the, the, we come to the sort of supernova of Goldie Mae Steiner's career, in which in a in a condensed form we see her amazing ability to transition from community to community. So, for example, 1938, uh, she is appearing at a fundraiser for the Urban League, the African-American social justice uh, organization, and she's appearing on a stage with the cornerstone African-American performers, Duke Ellington, Buck and Bubbles, uh, Fats Waller, uh, 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 Dorothy Dandridge, um, and yet she is booked as Goldie de Schwarzachazenta, not Gladys Mae Sellers, not her African-American birth name. She is booked as a, the Schwarzachazenta and is representing to this elite African-American community Chazonis, traditional East European Jewish Chazonis. Uh, an amazing uh, choice. The following year, she appears in a musical by the great composer Alexander Olshinetsky, who wrote great pieces like Mike State de la Belts. And here <coughs> in, in this play, the Polish Rebbe, the Polish rabbi, uh, she is appearing as Gladys Mae Sellers, her African-American, her American birth name, uh, when in fact she already had, as we know, uh, the, a stage name that was geared to, to the Jewish community. Uh, and, and her final uh, known performance, again, in another uh, Olshinetsky, uh, uh, the musical, uh, and but here, uh, the following year, she is not billed as Goldie uh, uh, Gladys May Sellers, but she's billed here as Goldie de Schwarze Chazente. So her ability to uh, navigate into and out of both of these communities was unprecedented. There, I, I in history, I've never actually found someone who was able to, uh, especially someone from a, a, a parallel minority to carry these uh, traditions. Sadly, after this, we lose track of Goldie, uh, Goldie uh, May Sellers, uh, and unfortunately do not know uh, uh, where, where or when she died. This uh, period, uh, the, 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 the passing of Thomas LaRue Jones and uh, the disappearance of, of, of Goldie May Steiner, uh, it really it, uh, lines up to the major changes in the Jewish world after World War II. That is, the decline of Yiddish as a powerhouse platform for the continuity of Jewish culture, 
of the change in cantorial, the cantillation going from the old artistic Shalia Sibur, the messenger of the people, to the emergence of uh, congregational singing, which changed the artistic dynamic uh, between the cantor uh, and the congregation. And finally, uh, a change in the historic socio-political dynamic between African Americans and Jews. Uh, Yiddish would no longer uh, be either that platform, the bridge in and out of the Jewish community. So with the passing of these two great stars, this amazing moment of uh, dynamic between these communities came to an end. Wow, what a virtuosic performance both of you just gave. <laughs> so uh, let me take the floor back briefly to tell you about some of our upcoming programs. This will give the audience time to put more questions into the chat box. We will get to audience questions in just a moment. And then after audience questions, we will have a chance for both of our speakers to give some final thoughts. So right now, let me just tell you about our three upcoming programs. Next week, we have the one and only Dr. Ruth Westheimer. It's her 94th birthday and she's spending it with us. So we're going to have a celebration. We have a wonderful movie about her life. We have children's books that she wrote that are available. And we have some images to show you of this book. She was a Holocaust orphan. Uh, she was born in Germany, uh, but she was sent on a kinder transport to Switzerland during World War II. And she writes about all of that in this children's book that you'll see in a moment. Here it comes. It's called Roller Coaster Grandma, The Amazing Story of Dr. Ruth, and it's appropriate for children of any age. It's perfectly G-rated, and I encourage people to get a copy for their children or their grandchildren. It's uh, really beautifully done, as you can see. So um, that is next week's program. There are tickets uh, required for next week. The price is $18, and as I mentioned, there is the opportunity to meet her over Zoom, ask her what you've always wanted to ask her, and um, we will then see a film and there are the books available. So that is next week. I hope you all will sign up. In two weeks time, we take a deep dive into Jewish genealogy. When, and when I say deep dive, I mean we're featuring two women who trace their roots back to pre-inquisition times. These are uh, the authors Doreen Carvajal and Jeannie Milgram. And uh, Doreen has written a book called The Forgetting River. And Jeannie Milgram has written a number of books, the first of which was called My 15 Grandmothers, where she traced, she, they were both raised Catholic, these women, and Jeannie traced her unbroken maternal line back 15 generations, which is really virtuosic. That's what she presents in the book. Since then, she's traced her, uh, her ancestry back uh, seven more generations to her 22 grandmothers. So you will want to meet these women and hear how they did this remarkable feat. That is a free program that will be on June 12th. And then on in three weeks time, it's Father's Day. And for that occasion, we are presenting a Jewish dynasty, the Morgenthau family, three generation of men, Henry Morgenthau Sr., who first cried out against the Armenian genocide. He was the ambassador to Turkey under President Wilson. And he was the first to uh, highlight, spotlight this terrible genocide that was happening to the Armenians. Then his son, Henry Jr. was in the Roosevelt administration, and he was the, the founder of the War Refugee Board. 
uh, and he fought, got the, the, the FDR administration to finally act to save the Jews of Europe from the Holocaust. And then his son, Robert Morgenthau, became the district attorney of New York. So it's this remarkable family devoted to human rights and social justice. And we will, we will meet a member of the Morgenthau family and have experts with us on that day. That too is a paid program, so tickets will be required. And all of this information will be in an email after today's program. So now let's get to your questions. And question number one is, uh, did Cantor Jones, by virtue of his prominence, influence other African Americans to become attracted to Judaism? Um, I again, there's a, 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 a mystery about <clears throat> Thomas LaRue Jones. I can only find anecdotal evidence uh, of his Judaism uh, that certain newspaper reports uh, indicate that he led services uh, at some of the um, uh, uh, Ashkenazic um, congregations, but it's anecdotal. Um, however, if he was not a, uh, if I if I can't prove that uh, he was uh, instrumental in encouraging people to convert to Judaism, I can point out I have found three references uh, to Talmud Torahs in Newark whose specialty was helping young African-American boys prepare for their bar mitzvah to teach them their Haftorah en route to learning how to be a cantor. So this was, um, this was not a one-off. This was a, a dynamic uh, moment in the, uh, in the uh, Black and Jewish cult cultural life in Newark. So uh, the, his ability to inspire young African-Americans to, to take uh, to the Ahmed um, is, is documented. So Rabbi Fanay, it's a question for you. And that is, you were mentioning that you recently celebrated 100 years of your community. Can you tell us about the origins of your, com of your community? How did it begin? Uh, the community of Beth Shalom in Chicago uh, began actually as the congregation of Ethiopian Hebrews in 1918. And so we have just celebrated, what is it, the 104th year we'll be celebrating this year in October. Um, <clears throat> I am the, the, the fifth rabbi to serve our community. Uh, my immediate predecessor, Rabbi Abihu Rubin, born in Jackson, Tennessee, um, served the community from 1947 until the time of his death in 1991. At that point, I became spiritual leader of the congregation. I am a uh, graduate of the International Israelite Board of Rabbis uh, Academy, Israelite Academy, as well as the uh, Spurtis College of Judaica in Chicago, Illinois, holding an undergraduate degree and a master's degree from uh, the Spurtis Institute of Judaica, and, and as well as uh, my rabbinic ordination. So <clears throat> our congregation, um, you know, we've had many stories written about uh, the congregation. Uh, probably the most famous was uh, the New York Times did a piece on us. Uh, and it was uh, very widely read. And I have to tell you, we attracted a great number of uh, visitors from all over the world, from Israel, Canada, Los Angeles, you name it. Um, and people came to worship in Dobbin with us. Uh, and then we also had a piece, you can find this on our website, uh, bethshalombz.org. You can find this on our website where we did a, uh, a piece with the um, Chicago Tonight Show, uh, which is a like a WTTW, a, a free television that's sponsored by other groups. Um, and uh, they did a fantastic uh, piece on our program about our community on their program. And that's been uh, very good. But for 104 years, our congregation, um, we are located in Marquette Park, uh, 6601 South Kedzie. Now Marquette Park is infamously known because Martin Luther King marched in Marquette Park and he was attacked so viciously in Marquette Park 
that he stated later that he had never experienced the hatred that he felt in Marquette Park that day. Now, the interest, I mentioned that to tell you that in 1965, when he marched in Marquette Park, the synagogue that we now occupy is located in Marquette Park. And the rabbi, Rabbi Schultz, opened the synagogue up and invited the people with Martin Luther King that if they had any trouble, that they could come to the synagogue for safety, to have a safe house. Unfortunately, he was attacked so viciously, so immediately into the march that he never even got three blocks to our synagogue. Now, here's the interesting point. <clears throat> Marquette Park, on the other side of the park, was the home of the American Nazi party. And so for Rabbi Schultz to make this offer, it, it was just fantastic. And I have to tell you, uh, his grandson is a member of our congregation today. Um, and we are fully in, embraced uh, within the Jewish community, uh, and, and in other religious communities as well, because I believe that we have to have tolerance. And we must be tolerant for any and all religious communities and that we must learn that tolerance. And to, as Martin Luther King would say, uh, you know, we have to learn how to love and how to get beyond um, the, the, the hatred that is ex exhibited in so many times uh, throughout the world. And, that is really springing back up in our society, unfortunately. Henry, there are some well, questions. Well, sorry, can, I, can I just, I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask the rabbi a question. Can I just uh, jump in? Of course. Uh, 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 rabbi Fane, your predecessor at the synagogue from uh, who was born in Tennessee, what religion did he grow up in? Uh, he grew up in a Christian religion and uh, he converted to Judaism. Uh, as I did as well. Uh, my family converted in the early 80s to Judaism. Um, all of my children are part of it. So therefore, my grandchildren, my, you know, all of our family are Jewish. And um, so, but that's, that's how he grew up. And that's how he identified. And he converted to Judaism um, as a way of reconnecting. And the reconnection, as you know, I hope most of your audience knows, Ethiopia is the home to one of the oldest communities of Jews in the world. And so we are Beth Shalom Benizakin Ethiopian Hebrew congregation. We are not Ethiopians, but Ethiopia is one of only two countries on the entire continent of Africa that were never colonized, Liberia and Ethiopia. And so for us, Ethiopian in, in our name means an unconquered spirit, a spirit that is unconquerable. And so therefore that stands for truth, that stands for righteousness. And so that's who we are. Thank you, Rabbi. Henry, there's a question about the recordings. So are there other recordings? I know you were looking for this particular recording for all those years, but are there other recordings of Thomas LaRue Jones and are there recordings of Golda, Golda Di Schwarze Hasente? Uh, no, uh, this, uh, I learned about this recording in the 1970s when I was helping prepare a book tracing the, the history, a listing of every ethnic and foreign record made in the United States between 1895 and 1942. And I found the listing in the recording engineer's uh, ledger about this session, but it took 40 years. Part of the problem, part of the reason that this recording was so rare is A, it was the only one that Thomas LaRue Jones made, but also because the OK Company when they recorded it in 1923, had already discontinued their Jewish catalog. So the records were barely distributed. Uh, in fact, in 40 years, I've only seen two copies, and I've, I've seen tens of thousands of 78s. Sadly, uh, Goldie, who was uh, uh, on radio for, for, for years, 
um, uh, who all the reviews say she was an extraordinary singer, for some reason never uh, was in a recording studio. There is no evidence that she ever made a commercial record. And I've checked uh, the, all the radio stations on which she performed in, in New York, WMCA, uh, WFBA, um, uh, long gone, long gone. So uh, I doubt uh, that they were ever recorded. So no, that's why this recording is so important because it stands in for all the, the recordings that we will probably, I, I won't say never, but uh, 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 unlike to uh, maybe someone has a uh, under their bed, perhaps a recording that they made, their grandfather's made, I'm ready to listen. So Henry, I know that everyone in our audience wants to read your book when it comes out, but Rabbi Fanay, we have an audience member who's asking, when are you going to write your book? Because my wife has been on story. me for over for many years. <laughs> and so I have to, I'm going to sit down and put pen to paper. Um, I've been approached by a couple of publishers um, some so many years ago, but I promise from your mouths to God's ears, oh, man. and particularly led by my wife. So it's coming. Fantastic. And sadly, I have to say that uh, I no longer have a book offer. The uh, the uh, the invitation was um, was was withdrawn. So I'm I'm in, in the process of looking for a uh, a publisher. So I, and I I'm looking forward. So. Uh, let's see, Henry, are there some final thoughts you would like to share with our audience? Um, I, I think the, um, the, the most, um, the, most uh, the, the big takeaway from this is that the received narrative of the dynamic between Jews and African Americans, especially when it comes to, to the history of culture and music and the arts, is, is of uh, the African American community as a wellspring of, of incredible musical talent. And Jews have historically been the, the interceder. That is, they were the managers, they owned the record companies, they owned the clubs. There was almost a sense that there wasn't a real binary sharing of the great musical gifts of both communities. So the story about Thomas LaRue Jones and the other black cantors is, is, is a counterbalance to the received narrative about uh, African Americans and Jews uh, being in an almost sort of a, a semi-parasitic uh, relationship. But here are these incredible uh, champions of, of, of a sound and an essence uh, the spintle yid, as he say in Yiddish, that, that spark of Jewishness that these African Americans took upon themselves and really showed that the, 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 the dynamic between these communities was a, a, a fully formed two-way street. Rabbi, what would you like to say in closing to our audience? In closing, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to be with you this afternoon. And I just want to say, I saw a question about who makes up our membership. We have a growing Latino cop, uh, population in our community uh, from Mexico. We have members from Colombia, South America. We have biracial Jews. We have African Jews. We have African-American Jews. We have uh, Jew, uh, Ashkenazi Jews who have adopted uh, black children. And we also now have a couple of Filipino Jews in our community. So I like to say that we represent what the Jewish community and the Jewish people have always looked like. And my last words are call Yisrael Hare Ben Zebaze, that we are all responsible for each other. Amen. Those are great words to end on. And I hope you all will join us next week and in the weeks to come. So thank you to our speakers and to our audience. See you soon. Bye bye, everybody. Have a wonderful bye bye. Memorial you. Day weekend. Thank you all. Take care. Bye, Rabbi. Bye.